This is the latest health update with my experiment in intermittent fasting. As mentioned in the previous video, it's not just about my heart anymore, but since that procedure in June, I also have tanking liver, kidneys, vitamin levels, and when I say tanking, I mean in March, before the procedure, all my numbers were really good. After the procedure in June, everything just went bad. To add to that, in August, I was also told that my blood hemoglobin and blood iron numbers were tanking as well, and that could be the culprit in why my breathing is so awful and my energy levels. Now it took a month between the doctor telling me I need iron infusions to the infusion center actually getting me in the door because they just had a reorg or something and it took way longer than it should have obviously. Hemoglobin is made in our bones. So think about the bones and you have marrow inside of the bones and basically iron that we eat ends up going in there and the marrow uses the iron to make hemoglobin. So it comes in this way and it comes out as hemoglobin. When you're born, your spleen actually produces hemoglobin. And then eventually as your bones mature, the bones take over, but your spleen can also augment this hemoglobin production. Hemoglobin is important because its job is to transport oxygen to the rest of the body through the blood. So let's say that a normal blood flow to the body has, I'll just say a concentration that looks like this of hemoglobin and that hemoglobin attaches to the oxygen as it goes through your lungs and that's what then carries the O2 through your body everywhere it needs to go. This all flows at a certain rate through your body, but in my situation, the heart back here is not happy. So it's not doing its job, which means instead of flowing at this rate, it's only flowing at some smaller rate. So I'm not getting as much of the hemoglobin, therefore I'm not getting as much of the oxygen as I should anyway. Now on top of that, what we're saying is that my hemoglobin numbers are way low, which means I don't even have as much hemoglobin, which means I don't have as much oxygen flowing to my body. So my body is getting way less concentrated oxygen in the blood as well as less flow or amount of it. So I have a double whammy already, and for a third whammy, I still have internal bleeding because my bladder, where they nicked it in a few places, is still not a lot, but I still periodically see blood. When I was getting the bikes ready to take to the museum, it was just more activity than I was used to, so there we go, we see a little bit more blood, which means now <laughs> you have some derailment of the blood as well, which means maybe I lost another equivalent oxygen carrier. Despite it being five months since the NYX, I am still on the blood thinners. So quite frankly at this point, I don't expect to stop seeing blood altogether until I'm off the blood thinners, which is in a month from now, because that'll be six months since the early June procedure. The logic with iron infusions is by giving your body more iron, your marrow has more raw materials to make more hemoglobin. Now there are situations like anemia, different variations that can be destroying the hemoglobin in the blood. In fact, what I learned is that if you have an artificial heart valve, those pieces shutting together in the valve can actually destroy some of those. There's also such a thing as runner's anemia or something that's uh, where when you run, your heel can be smashing 
the hemoglobin, I guess. So there's other things that can go on. They don't feel that that's an option for me or a possibility at this point, or at least likely, because again, in March, my numbers were fine. Even leaving the hospital in June, my hemoglobin numbers were still at like 12 in June, but there were down to nine here a couple months ago. Let's say call it August, September. So I've had five iron infusions, five weeks in a row, once per week, and I felt zero benefit from that in terms of my breathing and my fatigue. I also added a vitamin C, trying to help with the um, uptake of the iron in the system. I also, instead of trying to do a little swim and a little lift each day, I do swim one day and lift the next. So I've tried to do as much as I can to give the body what it needs to start recovering. It just doesn't appear, at least what I can say is that the iron infusions have not improved my breathing or fatigue at all. I have an appointment at the end of the week where they're gonna do blood labs and they will look at hemoglobin and iron again. Now, because the iron infusions didn't do any good, if they find that the hemoglobin and iron are still low, then that kind of means that that could still be the cause of my breathing and fatigue issues. And for some reason, the iron infusions just didn't work. Maybe we have to do more. Is it bad enough that we have to do a blood transfusion? I don't know. However, if the hemoglobin is back up where it should be, then that means that there's something else wrong that my breathing and fatigue is not good. So there's a lot depending on this next PCP appointment. Now earlier in this whole mess, when I first realized that the liver was having issues and the kidneys, I was debating, am I better to eat multiple meals throughout the day, but smaller, or would I be better to eat, say a big meal, and then not eat the rest of the day? In other words, what would burden my system the least and give the organs a chance to rejuvenate? Dr. Sinclair is tied to the biological health test that I did, if you saw that video. Uh, he's very big on longevity. So he's not training like a bodybuilder, eating six big meals a day and spending four hours a day in the gym to get huge. He's trying to look at longevity, best health, longest time. What he does is he'll eat one meal per day. So Dr. Sinclair, in one day is gonna have one meal, right? So he's gonna be nothing, he's gonna have a spike of food in his system, and then it's gonna taper off and he's gonna be back to nothing until the next day. His logic for that is that, yes, he puts a lot of food in himself at that point, but the rest of the day he is not eating He's fasting, we call it, and that means he's given his organs a rest. The general logic behind this is that your body has to process whatever you put into it. So as you put, let's call this a, some kind of steak here. So as you put food and drink in your body, they go down to your stomach, and then from there, it gets processed through your system and other things there like your liver and your kidneys and everything else, pancreas, whatever else, processes this food in the process that we call digestion. So if everything goes through there, this liver and kidneys sort of act like filters. So if you think about a filter on your car, it only lasts so many miles because that's how much stuff is flowing through it to get filtered out. Well, we don't get to replace our filters. We have one liver and two kidneys that were dealt at the beginning and it's all about how good we take care of them. So if we're filtering all this stuff and we're eating like a bodybuilder six times a day, pouring a ton of protein in there and everything, we are really taxing the liver and kidneys. We're taxing our digestive system. Sinclair is over here saying, well, if I only eat once a day, I use the digestive system here, 
But for the most part in a day, it's able to rest and rejuvenate. And that's part of the logic with this is that the intermittent fasting is this period where your body can sort of heal itself and cell rejuvenation, um, resting your organs, repairing your organs, all those things. Now in my case, this becomes important because not only are my liver and kidneys not doing great, but guess what? All this also takes blood flow from the heart to do this as well. So now if I'm eating too much food, then I'm also <laughs> taking even more of my oxygen and hemoglobin from my normal blood flow and from the body to deal with all this food. So I thought, okay, based on all this logic, let's try something, maybe not a one meal a day, but let's try a couple a day and let's give this intermittent fasting a try. Now I'm not Dr. Sinclair. I'm not a healthy person like he is. I have compromised organs. In the past I've noticed that if I have too big of a meal, then my breathing gets worse. Again, because think about this, I'm taking even more blood flow from an already short supply and now derailing it to the digestive system. So I was trying to avoid a big meal. But by spreading them out, I never give my organs a rest to recover. So I wanted to start the intermittent fasting and instead of the one big meal a day, what I do is I have two meals a day, basically breakfast and lunch, and then I schedule them around my activity. So I either go swim here and then eat and then have lunch and fast the rest of the day. Or I don't swim, but I lift between the two meals. So I have energy in me to go lift and I have recovery meal afterwards and the rest of the time I'm fasting. So I can have a daily habit or routine of eating breakfast and lunch, I still get my workouts in, it's strategic around the food, so I don't have low energy doing that, but I'm still giving my body a really good chunk of time. This is like say seven and this is like 12. So roughly that's given it about 19 hours of fasting. Now maybe I'll eat a little bit late sometimes or whatever, and you have to understand the discipline versus balance. For example, today I'm gonna go meet the neighbors for dinner tonight, so I know I'm gonna have dinner out here somewhere, so what that means is I had breakfast, I had my workout, and I had just a shake, and then I skipped lunch, and I'll be out, I'll have dinner, then I'll be back to fasting again. So you're gonna have interruptions to it, but they should be the exception and not the norm. The trick is also to try to eat enough food at lunch that you're not hungry by dinner, because if you eat something out here, you're kind of screwing up your fasting. So it's just something else you have to consider. I didn't want to go full Java mode at lunch, but I did have to eat enough, again, of healthy food to not be miserable by the end of the day. After intermittent fasting for just one week, I felt more improvement in my breathing, fatigue, all those things after one week of this than I did after five weeks of iron infusions. Now, I'm still not feeling great, but I probably feel better than I have since that June procedure, uh, which has been quite a while. So instead of 100% out of breath fatigue, now I'm say at 85 to 90. And after less than two weeks of intermittent fasting, I've already lost six pounds, but it makes sense. Let's think about the king of intermittent fasting, the constrictors like pythons and boas. They eat their mouse or rabbit or golfer, depending on their size, and then they go back into hiding for a month and then they come back out to feed again. And look how thin they are. So what is it that makes this experiment interesting for healthy people too? Most of you are not gonna feel a difference when your body weight fluctuates four to six pounds. I do, however, because I have compromised organs. So if let's say that you're at a tip point here of this is where I feel good and this is where I feel bad. Most of you are operating out here. So 
you going up and down the curve a little bit isn't gonna make a big difference to you. However, for me, where I'm already feeling kind of like in this bad zone here, feeling a little bit one way or the other makes a big difference to me. So if I feel that much better after just a week of intermittent fasting, does that not stand a reason that a healthy person could also benefit from intermittent fasting, even though they may not feel the difference in that week, how much are they offloading their organs by doing that and allowing time to heal? Another data point from this is that after just over a week of doing the intermittent fasting a few days ago, I noticed that I was much thirstier than normal and I was drinking a lot of fluids, in fact, more than normal, and not to be gross, but my urine was a very strong yellow and more foamy. It's hard for me to tell what's good and bad right now when it comes to the urine, because like I said, I still have blood in the urine, my kidneys aren't working the way they should, so I have to drink a gallon of water at least a day as well, but I can't drink too much more than that because then it might stretch my bladder out and make the bleeding worse. So there's a lot of balancing here I'm having to do. However, it did seem obvious that I needed more water during the fasting. Now I would have thought with the body being just kind of idle at the times I'm not eating, it wouldn't need as much water because it's not having to process and digest all that food. However, what that tells us is that because there's still things happening, it's not like I'm a bear hibernating for the winter, this is just a period where the body is still doing a lot. So chemically, it's using a lot of water, it's pushing a lot of water out, it's creating byproducts and everything else, which is interesting and it's not the same as when you're on keto, which I've done before, where it can cause electrolyte imbalances. This is just something different. So anytime you try any of these kind of different eating styles or habits, it's just good to make note of how much water you're taking in. Am I thirstier than normal? You know, what does your urine look like? Is that foamy? Um, the weather's also changing, it's getting dry. So you have to use what information you have. You're not gonna be doing daily blood draws, so you have to use the information available to you to make intelligent choices in how you take care of yourself. So still being a bit stuck in this purgatory of health, the next steps for me will be the blood labs on Friday to check the iron, hemoglobin, liver numbers, kidney numbers, vitamin levels, all those things. See if there's things that I can take out of my uh, prescription meds and supplements I'm taking. The early December, I also get to quit taking the Plavix or blood thinners, which hopefully will make the bladder quit bleeding and maybe that will allow the hemoglobin or sorry, the iron and that to go up. It's hard telling. I just gotta take it a step at a time. So the labs, the PCP, stop the Plavix. Let's see what happens. As far as my health routine goes, I'll be doing the same thing I've been doing because it at least seems to be pushing in the right direction or not making things worse, where I'm eating breakfast and lunch. And I'm either swimming before breakfast or lifting between the two meals and then resting as I need. Good night's sleep. If I'm tired enough, take a nap as long as it's not too late where it screws with my night of sleep. As you recall from one of the earlier videos, the biggest question I'm really trying to answer is, okay, Here's where I'm at today, and this would be in quality of health. In other words, considering the breathing, the fatigue, all that stuff. Am I going to get better at some point with everything and then eventually degrade, or is this just down from here? And of course, there's still the daily uh, risk of death every day, which is a nice cloud to have hanging over you, but it's sunny out today. So which is it? Because this chart is what's gonna help me decide what kind of things, what kind of options do I have with the time I have left. And if we use past data to predict future data, well, here in June was that procedure to plug the leaks and they seem to have worked and I have not felt anything but bad since then. I pretty much felt bad before that, back to like say November of 23. 
So in October, I was still feeling good. I felt normal, active. I could go for a hike. I could uh, take the uh, kayak out with the dog and not be short of breath. I could go upstairs and everything. But the last time I felt that good was in October of 23, which is over a year. So since I have over a year of feeling bad, just being practical, it's hard to really be very hopeful that suddenly magic is going to happen and I'm going to get better for a while and down. So until the doctor tells me otherwise, I kind of have to plan that this is probably the best I'm going to get and all I can do is healthy habits and being smart about it to try to hang on to this as much as I can. If you haven't done so, please click the link below to subscribe to the channel and hit the little bell for notifications. And let's live for today.